Good job. Well, take your Bible and go back, if you will, and look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8, where the Bible says to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, he is after the whom's tonight. He's not after the possessions. He's not after, if you would please, the things that are goals, but he's after the who's tonight that's in this room. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says, says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I think it's very important tonight for us to understand the devices of the wicked one. I think it's important tonight that we understand the devices of the devil. How is it that the devil attacks? We're going to study tonight the attacks of the devil. It would be good to be able to know how he attacks. You know, if you have an adversary that's getting ready to come against you, it would be wise to be able to know the strength and the weakness is of your adversary. It would be wise to be able to know uh, exactly what they're about. If you had somebody tonight that was going to maybe point a gun at you, it would be good to know if the gun had bullets in it. It would be good to know if maybe the gun was something that was usable. It might be good to know if uh, they're pointing it at you and they're a hundred yards away. If they're blind as a bat and they can't shoot anything that's more than five foot away. I mean, it would be good to know. It would be good to know some things about the devil tonight and how the devil tries very, very hard to destroy individuals and family members. So let's look at it tonight. Uh, in our Bibles, we see this. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 39, the Bible says, Moreover, your little ones says, which he said should be a prey. Now, I'm going to stop right there because the devil wants to be able to overtake our little ones. So Satan attacks the weaning ones, the little ones, if you will, please. He attacks the little ones. He attacks those that don't have full knowledge of who he is. He attacks those tonight that are the little ones that are not experienced in spiritual warfare. He attacks those tonight that are not experienced in being able to walk in the faith. He attacks those tonight uh, that are not fully developed in their instincts. He attacks the little ones tonight because they're inquisitive, they're curious, so he provides a way to lure them into the wrong places. He attacks those tonight that are not fully able to defend themselves. He attacks the innocent tonight, the unlearned tonight, those that are easy as we would consider prey tonight. He attacks the simple ones tonight. He attacks the young people tonight. He puts a target on them and he tries to attack them to destroy them tonight. They're simple in their Bible knowledge. Many times a young person is simple in the way that they think. And so they're easy prey. The Bible says over in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 30, even the youths shall faint and be weary, it says. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall. It's not talking about an old man. It's talking about a young man. Uh, over in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible says, and beheld among the simple ones. I discern, it says, among the youths, a man void of understanding. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 and in verse 3, the Bible says, a prudent man foreseeth evil uh, and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 22, the Bible says, flee you for lust. Uh, but follow, it says, righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, why does he say flee youthful lust? Normally, the same thing that you had trouble with when you were a youth is the very same thing that you'll have trouble with all the days of your adulthood life. Uh, if you have a weakness as a young person, if you're not careful, if you don't let God 
help you to be able to get the victory uh, that will cause a following all the days of your life. Now, by the way, uh, 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 Satan and his imps know that very well. Have you ever noticed that evolution is taught to the younger children in the public school? Have you ever noticed that? Uh, why? Because when you get older, you start to study things out for yourself and you come to the full knowledge of the truth. All right. But they try to take and brainwash. I said brainwash. Let me say it one more time. They try to take and brainwash the younger of the crowd. Uh, you notice that it's uh, an, an unreasonable theory. You ever notice that about evolution? You ever know that what they try to do is they try to feed it into the hearts of our young people uh, that the earth is millions of years old when there's no proof whatsoever? You ever notice how what they're trying to say about evolution uh, doesn't make logical sense? Do you ever notice it doesn't even line up with science? Have you ever noticed that there's uh, no factual evidence of it whatsoever? Have you ever noticed that it's not reasonable? Have you ever noticed that it goes against the truth of the Bible? Have you ever noticed that there is no proof in it whatsoever? And have you noticed that it's only used to attack the young children's minds? Because us that are adults know better. Those of us that are educated, you can search out the matter and find the truth and how ridiculous evolution is for anybody to be able to buy into it. It doesn't take much brains to figure out what the truth is. Now, a lazy person won't figure it out because they won't take the time to study it. So they're led to the slaughter as a lamb that's led to the slaughter. But you'll see they always attack the young minds. Uh, uh, with that which is sex education. Can I remind you that Obama said this, that it should even be taught to the kindergartners. Now, he said that when he was president. But you know what they do? Uh, they try to confuse them. That's why we have the, the gender problem today. Uh, what are they doing? They're confusing the young minds. Those of us that are educated, hey, we got it figured out. Doesn't take much, but we got it figured out. But, uh, but yet, uh, those that are simple in their faith, simple in their minds, what do they do? They can't figure it out. Can I tell you, Hollywood is a great tool, I believe, of the devil. Yeah. Hollywood attacks the young person's mind. Uh, they pump the wrong things in the young person's mind. They pop... Uh, uh, if you would please, in the young person's mind, they'll pop the idea that immodesty is okay. They'll pop the idea that immorality is okay. They'll pop it in and they pop it in and they pop it in through the cartoons. They pop it in and they pop it in through the sitcoms. They pop it in and they pop it in through that which is the family, supposed to be the family uh, watching time, if you will, prime time. They'll, they'll pop in nudity here and uh, they'll push in the cursing there and the swearing there and the violence there and the gang uh, violence and uh, the rock music and the homosexuality and the lesbianism and the witchcraft and the humanism and the magic and the drinking and the uh, smoking and the drug uh, using culture and all sorts of stuff do they do to be able to put it in there but you notice what they're doing uh, a lot of it nowadays appeals to the younger generation why because those of us that are not of the youngest generation we're not swayed by it we know what we believe we know and we're persuaded about what is right that's how come we can stand up and we can uh, lecture, we can stand up and teach, we can stand up and preach, and we can do it with great authority and boldness. Why? Because we know what is right. We don't have to be taught those things are wrong. Have you ever noticed even the Disney uh, cartoons and channels I do here? Here's what they do. They'll bring in uh, some wickedness here and some wickedness there. What are they doing? They're doctrinating your kids. They're saying it's okay. But can I tell you, sodomy is not okay. Witchcraft is not okay. Magic is not okay. Can I tell you tonight that rock music uh, that's destroying the souls of young people around America, it's not okay. Can I tell you that uh, immorality when uh, a young person, uh, and isn't it something in the summertime where people take their clothes off? Now, wait a minute. Can I tell you something is just as wrong in the summertime as it would be in the wintertime, except in the wintertime, they'd freeze so they got enough common sense to keep it on. 
I'm saying this. I'm saying that they use, and by the way, rock music years ago would, uh, was devised to be able to reach the heart and the young people of those that was 10 years of age to 17 years of age. About uh, uh, five to 10 years ago, that changed drastically. They were uh, wanting to get more of a crowd. So the average rock music uh, performer today, uh, they try to focus on those that are 10 to 15 years of age. That started back with Britney Spears, and that started back with Jonas Brothers, and it started back with uh, uh, Hannah Montana, and it started to be able to reach into that younger culture. Why? Because if they can get them then and get them hooked, they'll carry them all the way through. You know how many people I know that got hooked on drugs when they were young? And they've been drug users ever since. You know how many people I've seen over the years that got hooked on the wrong and that wrong has carried them all the way through all the days of their life. So no wonder they attack the weaning ones. No wonder they try. And by the way, the devil's not uh, fair. He's mean. Uh, he's cruel. And by the way, he does play for keeps. Amen. So what happens? I'm saying there's attack. There's an attack. There's an attack, if you would please, from the devil. One of those attacks is the fact that he attacks the weaning ones. Then he attacks the weak ones. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, here's what the Bible says. The Bi Somebody asked me the other day, they said, I don't understand. Some preachers get up and they'll read one verse and they'll preach for an hour. You get up and you read verse after verse after verse. Why do you do that? Because I want you to see that it's from the Bible. I'm, I don't want you to make a choice or make a decision based on a Mike Wells or, or a story I tell. And I'm all for stories. I wish I was a good storyteller. Matter of fact, if you start doing some dumb stuff, I might have some good story material. But I think young people ought to be able to go back and say, thus saith the word of God. I mean, you ought to be able to point back and say, this is what the Bible says. Amen. And I agree with the Bible. Yes. Therefore, I'm going to make this decision based on a principle found in the Word of God. Can I remind you, please, that the Word of God standeth sure. Amen. The Word of God's not going to fall. Your opinion may fall, but the Word of God is not going to crumble. I'm saying this, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, the Bible says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block unto them that are weak. So God says, uh, you've got liberty. And by the way, you do. We live under grace. We love grace. But can I tell you, don't use the liberty that you have as that which will cause you to stumble or cause somebody else to stumble over that which is your life. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 11, the Bible says, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. So here's a person that's going to perish for whom Christ died. So God says, be careful. You, you know, there's reasons why we don't do some things it's not necessarily because something is absolutely wrong. But it might be something that causes somebody to stumble. Amen. You know, Paul did not want to be somebody that caused somebody to stumble. Amen. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to mess with your brain. Because I know you got one. That was a deacon. There's nothing wrong with taking grape juice and drinking it out of what looks like a wine bottle. It's grape juice. But my Bible says to abstain from the appearance of evil. So somebody passing by and they see that you're, you're taking the bottle like that, they say, oh, I didn't know that brother so-and-so drank. You just now became a stumbling block. Oh, preacher, you want us to live. Yeah, godly. There's nothing wrong with uh, taking a candy cigarette. And as a 42-year-old man, putting it right there. 
But can I tell you, that third grader riding by says, I didn't know my Sunday school, sm- my Sunday school teacher smoked. Stumbling block. He said, preacher, you're taking it too far. Depends on if you want to be a stumbling block. Amen. By the way, listen to me. I'd rather be in a church. I've said this for many years. I've been now here over eight years as pastor. I would rather live here and somebody shoot for it than to live here and somebody trip over it. I would rather go to a church where the standards are higher than I have than to go to a church where the standards are lower than I have because you will always migrate to the lowest level. You will. If social drinking is acceptable in most places, and you are in most of those places, if you're not careful, that becomes the norm. I'm saying this. I'm saying there's the attacks on the weak ones. Okay? You have to watch. You have to watch. Why? Because uh, some weak ones are not as strong. Some weak ones are not as fast. Some weak ones are not as smart. Some weak ones are not as big. Some weak ones are not as agile. Some weak ones are not as healthy. And the devil still goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says, We then that are strong ought to, in, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And it says not to please ourselves. So he says, find somebody that is weak and help them. Now, by the way, he didn't say judge them. <clears throat> didn't say judge them. I tell you, I, I can't believe so and so. They did that. Ooh, I just can't believe they're such a sinner. Well, wait a minute, you're a sinner too. Well, I can't believe that they would say such and such. Oh, shut up. You said worse. And if you didn't say it, you thought it. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we come off our spiritual high horses and just decide we're going to love somebody and help somebody? Well, I just can't believe that so and so would do that. Oh, come on. What are you doing when nobody's looking? Come on. Yeah, most of the stuff that we're hiding is worse than the stuff that we're revealing. And by the way, you, each one of us could testify. Amen. So I'm saying, don't, don't, be, don't, don't be one of these people who walk around, you got your nose stuck in the air. No. Don't be some, well, you know, I'm just so good. Well, we never would have figured it out until you told us. Stop it. Get on your Facebook and get on your texting and get on this other stuff and say, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, shut up. Who cares? You ought not care about... Look, it, and by the way, if somebody gets on Facebook, they start talking about somebody else. Look, take my bare words and say, oh, shut up. You said that's not polite. That's not politically correct. Then emphasize it with all capital words. Oh, shut up. Exclamation points behind it. Look, I'm saying this. I'm saying that we behave. I'm saying that we need to take and help people. That, these guys are joking. Oh, you're, you're figuring out. Oh, uh, put it in quotes. and uh, No, not Mike Wells. Casey Palmore. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. The Bible says now, it says, we exalt you. Now listen, or we exhort you. It says, now we exhort you, brother. It says, warn them that are unruly. So what do you do with an unruly person? You warn them. Say, man, don't do that again. That's dumb. That's stupid. Don't do it again. You warn them. It says, comfort the feeble-minded. Comfort the feeble-minded. Then it says this. It says, support the weak. Support the weak. Oh, but here it goes. Be patient toward all men. Oh. Man, man those, those first three, they're, boy, I like to warn the unruly. I like to be able to comfort the feeble-minded. Support that weak. I feel good about that. Mm. But be patient toward all men. You got to be kidding me. I mean, all men should be like me. 
Well, that's what the average church member thinks. If they only knew what I knew, they'd be better off. If they knew what you knew, we wouldn't need you. I'm saying this. I'm saying uh, uh, Satan comes and he attacks. He attacks the weaning ones. He attacks the weak ones. Listen, he attacks the weary ones. Weary ones. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, the Bible says, and let us not be weary. By the way, this is written to the saints of God that was serving God. Let us not be weary in well-doing. He says, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So those that are serving God faithfully, guess what? There's going to come a time in your life when you get weary, tired. You know, they that are strong, they that are smart, those that are stout, those that are serving God. I'm talking about Sunday school teachers. I'm talking about bus captains. I'm talking about choir members. I'm talking about nursery workers. I'm talking about children's workers. I'm talking about teen workers. I'm talking about deacons. I'm talking about deacons' wives. I'm talking about ushers. I'm talking about soul winners. I'm talking about dedicated people. Here's what God says. God says, you better be careful. You're going to get weary. By the way, weariness for those that are serving is common. Weary people run buses even though they're weary. They still teach Sunday school classes even though they're weary. They still sing in the choir every service even though they're weary. They still work in the nursery as they're rotated in and out even though they're weary They still attend church. They still go soul winning. They still read the Bible. They still pray. They still put money in the offering plate as tithe and offering. They still try to rear a godly family. They still try to uh, wear the right type of clothing and listen to the right type of music. They still try to uh, speak right. They still try to keep a joyful spirit. But can I tell you, no matter how much you try to still do that, Uh, there's going to come a time when you get weary. Let me prove it to you. Noah became weary, and after that he found himself drunk and uncovering himself in a tent. The children of Israel got weary. Then they started to gripe. Then they started to grumble against the man of God who was Moses. Moses became weary. Uh, He began to complain, and uh, then instead of speaking to the rock, he smote it instead. Moses became weary again. Then what happens? He puts down his arms and the soldiers fighting in the battle begin to lose. Elijah becomes weary and he goes to sit under a Jupiter tea, tree and not the tea. He didn't sit under the tree to drink tea, but he went to sit under the Jupiter tree and he wished to God he'd be dead. David became weary, came back from the battlefield, uh, and then all of a sudden those men rise up and say, uh, let's go ahead and stone him. David got weary again and he stayed home, uh, fell in the sand, and committed adultery. Uh, Job became weary and he spoke out of a bitter soul. Peter became weary and he gave up and went fishing. Our Lord Jesus became weary after he fasted for 40 days and the devil cometh after him and tempteth him to go into the wilderness. So uh, you're going to face weariness in your life. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Let me give you one more and I'm done. Here it is. The devil attacks the weaning ones. He attacks the weak ones. He attacks the weary ones. He attacks, stay with it now, the wounded ones. You know, in fundamentalism, and I think probably in every other type of group that has a religious gathering, If we're not careful, when somebody gets wounded, we kick them. We're not supposed to kick them. We're supposed to help them. Our Lord Jesus is all about restoring. Listen to it. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14. The Bible says, the spirit of a man will sustain, let's do it now, will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? You know, when somebody gets their spirit down, they're almost through. It's almost over. You have to protect your spirit. Now, by the way, only God can help you 
to gas up your spirit. The world can give you happiness as you find happiness in happenings. That's where you get your happiness in happenings. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy does not come from without. Joy comes from within. As you walk with God and you yield yourself to the Holy Ghost of God, then you find joy. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, looking diligently, the Bible says, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Didn't say the grace of God fail. says that man fails. Man fail of the grace of God. Listen to it now. Lest the root of bitterness springing up trouble you, whereby many are defiled. A person can turn into somebody that just quits when their spirit is not what it should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10 says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 26, the Bible says, For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slayed by her. Now why? Somebody overtook the spirit. Hey, I got one more. Here it is. We're done. Twelve pages right here of sermon notes. Twelve pages. Here's the last one. He attacks the weaning, the weak, the weary, the wounded. Here it is. I'm done. And he attacks the wanderer. The person just kind of wanders around. You ever see somebody lost? <laughs> I, I know it's probably not funny, but you ever see him? I, my daddy had a dog he did not want. He lived in Delaware, my daddy and the dog. And he said, Mike, one time I visited him in Delaware, he said, I got that dog out there. He said, I don't want to shoot it because I'll feel bad. He said, I don't want you to shoot it because I'll feel bad for telling you to shoot it, and I know you will. He said, so can you just kind of take it down way out, way, way out in farming country? Just kind of drop them off because you know how those farmers are. They love dogs. You know how those ranchers are? Isn't that right, Jared? Debbie. <laughs> you got a dog. Give, me, give it to me. No, don't give it to me. I'll give you their address. You can drop it in the front yard. <laughs> love dogs. Now, can I tell you what? I said, okay, Daddy, whatever you want. I put that dog in the back of that truck. I went out, I tell you, I traveled for about 30 minutes. 30 minutes, left at 9 o'clock. Traveled for about 30 minutes. I looked at that dog, I said, get out of the truck. It looked at me, sad eyes. I mean, making a little sorrowful face. No, he didn't sound like you. And I said, get out of the truck. And so it wouldn't obey. So I pushed it out. I drove off. I thought, I'm not worried about that dog. That dog's going to find a good home. I kept telling myself that for 30 minutes going back. I need to obey my daddy. I need to obey my daddy. I need to, that dog's going to find a good home. I'm going to obey my daddy. I'm going to obey my daddy. I got home, oh, I don't know, probably about 10 a.m. or something like that. You know by about 1 o'clock, there's something sitting on the front porch. <laughs> I open that screen, and there's that same dog. Now, how did he remember that I took a right and took a left and took a right and took a left and took a right and took a left, went through uh, the woods, went down uh, these uh, uh, dumpy roads? And uh, uh, how did he know how to, how did he write all those instructions down? <laughs> My daddy looked at me and said, well, if he wants to be at home that much, I guess it's all right. You know, when my dad died, that dog was still there. Can I tell you this? Can I tell you? There's those that are the, the wandering ones. You know, uh, when a person wanders around, if they're not careful, if they're not plugged in, that's why our young people need definite direction. A young person that doesn't have definite goals and definite directions will 
finally, almost every single time, get themselves in trouble. Uh, that's why you, you say, preacher, why you emphasize soul winning so much around this place? Well, number one, because people are lost. Amen. Number two, we ought to, as honest Christians, give out the gospel. But can I also tell you this? For a young person that is not where they ought to be, if they'll get plugged into soul winning, it gives them something to live for that they never had before. Because somebody else can be able to be saved because you just cared. You just cared. I was preaching down at Gulfport, Mississippi, the 15th annual Deep South Youth Conference on Thursday night, and I gave an invitation, and there's about six kids in the auditorium got saved. And then I got word that about seven of them uh, went back to the hotels, and they were under such uh, conviction that they went to their counselors, and seven got saved in the hotels. <laughs> I said this morning, uh, the, the neatest thing out of all that is Caleb Carr, Dan Carr's son that was in Hungary, was watching live stream, and he called his daddy over to the phone as we were giving an invitation. And he said, Daddy, I'm not saved. I need to get saved. Now, that's the preacher's son. Look, can, can I tell you that uh, uh, when you get plugged in the right... Oh, I was preaching up in, uh, 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 up in uh, North Carolina. Uh, it was over... Uh, uh, oh, I forget the name of that place. But I was preaching for a brother, and all of a sudden, it was on a Sunday night, and uh, a lady came down the aisle. She'd been a Sunday school teacher for 22 years. 22 years, a Sunday school teacher. And she said, I'm not saved. And she got saved. Carol Tussie's wife, uh, uh, a deacon, deacon and a deacon's wife. Carol Tussie's wife went into the hospital, Mrs. Tussie. When I was uh, an evangelist out of the Grace Independent Baptist Church in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and uh, Mrs. Tussie went in the hospital, and you know how I am. If I find out you're in the hospital and you're going to stay there an awful long time, I bring you a book. Because hospital walls get boring to look at. So I'll bring you a book. Now, don't go in the hospital just to get a book. It's not worth it. You can't sell the book and make that much money to pay your hospital bill. But I'll bring you a book. And I, uh, years ago, Mike Ray put those one steps out, and I helped to bring them back in uh, to uh, production and uh, rewrote a couple of things with his permission, stuff like that. So I took her that stack of one steps. And it goes 43. We use it for a discipleship. 43 different lessons. And I gave it to Mrs. Tussie. And Mrs. Tussie said, Brother, brother, brother Mike, she said, uh, you, you don't expect me to read all these. I said, No, just pick out the ones that you want and read through them. So she kept staring at that one, the first one, Assurance of Salvation. She kept staring at it. She thought, You know, uh, uh, I don't need that one. I'll just set that one aside. And she said, You know, I felt like that was number one. And if I was going to do it, I needed to do it in order. So I read number one. She said, By the time I got done reading number one, I realized I wasn't saved. Deacon's wife. Deacon's wife. You know, the first year that I was here, uh, we had 17. You'll remember this. We had 17 of our own members. They got saved and baptized here. Wasn't saved. You know, it just helps to uh, be able to know, know that you're saved and know your direction. I'll be honest with you. I worry about people. I'm not saying you're not saved. But I worry about people that say that they are saved. I'm not saying you're not saved. But I worry about people that say that they're saved, but they never want to do anything for Christ. I just worry about them. You know, you never see them praying and saying grace at the table. Uh, you never hear them talking Christian talk. They never pass out a gospel track. They don't care if anybody burns in hell. Mm, I worry about stuff like that. Because if you're truly saved, you have the same. Listen to me. If you're truly saved, you've got the same Holy Ghost inside of you as I've got inside of me. Here it is. I'm done. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 6. The Bible says, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and the high hill. Yea, it says, My flock was scattered upon the face of the earth, and none of them did seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because, it says, My flock became prey. My flock became meat for every beast in the field. Because there was no shepherd, neither did the shepherd search 
for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Well, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be a shepherd of a church that never feeds his flock. I don't want somebody to get out of church and me not chase them. I want to chase them. I want to get them back to where they should be. Now, I'm saying this, and here it is. I'll read two more verses. We'll shut her down. Psalm 119, verse 10. The Bible says, with my whole heart I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Psalm 17, in verse uh, 4, the Bible says, concerning the works of men. It says, thy word and thy lips have I kept. It says, uh, have kept me, it says, have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. You know, we have to be people that just decide that when the attacks of the devil come, that we know we are privy to his devices. We're privy. You know how many times a person come to my office and they'll say, Preacher, I got an idea. They'll tell me their idea. And I'll say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Don't do that. Here's a Bible principle that will show you what not to do. Don't do that. That's, that's just like, I mean, uh, stupid. Don't do that. I've got two things in my office. One of those I heard Brother Ray use in a conference, and it says no. It says no about 15 times, different ways. And, uh, and one day I was counseling somebody in my office, and, and they said, do you think I ought to do that? I said, let me answer that in just a few short words. And I pulled it out, and I pressed it, and it said, No! And it said in different tones, no, 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 no. And I said, so what do you think? And they said, oh, I think it's no. <laughs> now, I don't do that hurt somebody's feelings. And by the way, I only do that with people I know I can get away with it because they know how much I love them. Yeah. Rebecca Butler used to be Rebecca McCarty. Daniel's been good to her. Because it used to be before she was married, she'd come in my office she sat in the chair, and this is when she's in Bible college here, and I'd say, Rebecca, can I help you? And she'd be, ah! <laughs> Man, she'd just start to cry. She'd use up all of my tissue. And i said, Rebecca, get it out. And she'd, ah! I said, well, you know, get over it and eventually get it out. Now she's married, and she don't come in and cry no more. That's because she gets to cry on him, not me no more. <laughs> No, but you know what I think one of the differences is? Purposes. They have a purpose to go to Brazil. Come on. When you get all wrapped up, not in yourself, oh, please, please hear me. But when you get wrapped up in pleasing the Lord, it changes you. Because, see, now you're not living for you. Well, I got my, 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 I got my feelings hurt. What's the problem? They're your feelings. <laughs> Amen. You know, uh, there was a preacher. He said, man, I, I love listening to you on the... He, he's listening tonight, too. He said, I love listening to you on that live stream. He said, but sometimes it hangs up. And he says, you know how you take your head sometimes? You go like this. He said, it hangs up right about there. And he said, you look like one of those bobbers. <laughs> the attacker's going to come. It's going to attack the weaning. That's the little ones. It's going to attack the weak, the weary ones, the wounded ones, and the wandering ones. So, preacher, what do I do? Submit yourself to a holy God. Say, God, here I am. I'm going to give you all. I, I've been preaching 34 years, I think, something like that. I'm not the greatest preacher in the world, but I tell you, I've seen invitations that I've given where many, many people get saved. Now, it's not because of Brother Wells. I know me but it's because of a holy God. You know, you'd be amazed. I remember leading a guy to Christ that was a governor over in the Philippines. And uh, I led him to Christ. He helped me in a, 
one of the meetings there, get a place to meet. He said, next year I'm running for the Senate. I said, that's neat. I didn't know that him and a couple of other sinners, he just got saved. He didn't know much about the Bible. But uh, they wanted to try and really push the same-sex marriage thing over in the Philippines. And uh, they stood against it in Congress. And he was one of them that stood. Just a young believer. But see, God can even use young believers. I remember uh, meeting with a senator one time, and he, you know, I don't know. I guess he tried to impress me or something. I'm not really sure. But took me out. He had a private yacht. And he took me out on his yacht. He said, I'd like to feed you steak of your choice. We're out in the ocean, you know. He said, I'd like to feed you the steak of your choice. I said, well, before we do that, we need to talk. Let me ask you a couple of questions. And by the way, the pastor got me on that boat with him. said, look, when we get out there, like, you know, and we can't come back real quick, that's a good time to witness to him. <laughs> so he had it set up pretty good. So here we get on this fancy little yacht, you know. Well, it wasn't little. But we got on this yacht. We went out there. I like to feed you. He said, I got my chefs and all that. He said, I'll feed you the steak of your choice. I said, well, before we eat that, I want to tell you about a steak that's better than any steak you could ever put your teeth into on this boat. He said, what you talking about? I said, uh, let me show you how to taste of the Lord and see that he is good. I said, do you have a relationship with God? I said, if this boat capsized right now and we all went under, where are you going? You're going to go to heaven or you're going to burn in hell? He said, I've never been asked that before. I said, well, think on it. Where are you going to go? He said, well, I'd like to go to heaven. I said, so look at it right here. You know that man got saved. You'd be surprised what God could do if you'd yield yourself to him. Do you know that? You remember I got saved because of a teenage boy? A teenage boy led me to Christ. Don't tell me God can't use you. But you can get off track and never do what you're supposed to do for God. And the devil uses many things to get you off track. Father, help us, I pray. Thank you for these dear folk.